10th and 11th centuries. During this time, we're going to see, as we mentioned last time, an increased estrangement between the Greek and Latin churches, but that's not all we're going to see. We, of course, will mention this evening the event of 1054, but we will attempt to give it the attention it deserves, neither more nor less. But we must also uh, focus on a number of other things during this period. And we'll begin in the East. Uh, this two-century period for the Greek church was, for the most part, a time of flowering, a sort of renaissance, as it were. And we'll begin by mentioning three very significant figures of the 10th century in the Greek church. The first is uh, a man named Simeon, St. Simeon the translator, sometimes the word for translator in Greek, metaphrastes is used to identify this man. He, he is uh, most known for his collection of the lives of the saints. It was the first time in the Greek church that there was a major attempt made to, to gather and edit uh, all of the lives, lives and legends of the saints that had existed up to this time and that were frequently read in the course of the church services. Uh, many of these had, had existed in forms of oral stories that were passed on or also written records, some coming from the time when the saints lived, some coming from a later time, and Simeon, the translator, uh, attempted to put them all in, in one, uh, one cohesive written source. So much of, many of the saints' lives that we read even now to our day come from his collection. He's also known uh, as the author of uh, a couple of the prayers in the prayer book for before and after Holy Communion uh, that are very faithful, to, that are very familiar to the Orthodox faithful. Then we have a second uh, very important development that takes place right around the turn of the millennium, and that is the establishment of communal monasticism on Mount Athos by Saint Athanasius of Mount Athos. Athanasius was a man who had a high position in the court, but abandoned it all to become a monk. He wanted increased solitude, so he went further and further away from the city and from established monasteries, and finally uh, wound up on the peninsula of Mount Athos, which for those familiar with the map of the area, you'll, you'll recall that there are three peninsulas that, that uh, jut out from, from Greece, eastern Greece, from Thrace, as it's called, near the, near the city of Thessalonica. And one of these peninsulas from very early times uh, has been called the Holy Mountain and was given over to uh, monastic life. But up until the 10th century, it was in a very disorganized form. There were not organized monasteries. Rather, there were uh, dwellings of hermits scattered through the peninsula. And Athanasius went there in the 10th century with, with the blessing of, of the emperor and the church authorities and began to organize monastic life there. And he began the monastery that is called the Great Lavra, and that is the first monastery in the hierarchy of the Athenite monasteries to this day. He met a great deal of resistance uh, from the hermits who lived there. They had a kind of lone ranger sort of monastic life, and they were not too happy about somebody coming to try to organize them. So they gave Athanasius a hard time. Uh, but nevertheless, the monastic life that Athanasius brought to Mount Athos continued from his day until now with many, many more monasteries beginning, some during his lifetime and, and others afterwards, so that uh, Mount Athos becomes from the time of the 10th century the center of Byzantine monastic life, particularly as we're going to see uh, in only a few short centuries when the Turks begin to gobble up more and more of the previously Christian Greek lands uh, that had many monasteries in Asia Minor, for example, uh, monastic life becomes more and more centered on Mount Athos. 
And then we have a, a third uh, great saint of, of the 10th century, Saint Simeon the New Theologian. And this title, theologian, in, in this case, the new theologian for St. Simeon, has been used very sparingly in the, in the tradition of the Orthodox Church. There are, there are actually only three to whom it is formally given. Of course, there are many more theologians than three in the church, all of the great fathers who we would call theologians. But this title, uh, setting, setting three men apart as, as very unique, uh, mouthpieces of the wisdom of God has been reserved in the church first for St. John the Apostle, the beloved apostle, who is, who is called St. John the Theologian. Secondly, for St. Gregory the Theologian, who, as you recall, was contemporary with St. Basil the Great and did so much to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity. And finally, uh, St. Simeon the New Theologian. And he began in a monastery in, in the city of Constantinople, but very soon became a kind of prophetic mouthpiece for the renewal of not only monastic life, but Christian life in general. He had an experience early in his life in which he saw the glory of God, and he was to give the rest of his life to a life of prayerful contemplation and teaching that the purpose of the human existence is to enter into the vision of God. Sometimes St. Simeon the New Theologian is called the greatest mystic of the Orthodox Church in that he most intensely in his writings and through his life uh, exemplifies this, this desire to experience the union of God, not the union with God, not simply to talk about it, to discourse about it, but actually to experience it. And St. Simeon's teachings were uh, met with uh, a certain amount of uh, opposition as, as most prophetic teachings that call people to the most basic renewal of, of their existence do. He also, uh, he, he did some things that, that people regarded as, as rather strange, people, people in authority. He, he uh, had a great love and devotion to his spiritual father, who, whose name was also uh, Simeon, Simeon the Elder. And after his spiritual father died, he began to celebrate the, the memory of, of the departure of his spiritual father as a great feast in his monastery. And, and some, some were complaining that, that he's celebrating the memory of this man uh, who has not been canonized yet by the church, not been enrolled among, among the, the list of the church's saints, as if it were a feast as great as Pascha. It, it was written at the time. So people, people criticized him for being kind of outside the mainstream. And indeed, his insistence that unless a person seek and finally realize the vision of the uncreated light of God, that person cannot, set, cannot be said to be truly and perfectly a Christian, St. Simeon taught. So, the entire purpose of everything that is given us in the church, true doctrine, the sacraments, the life of prayer, the life of ascetic struggle, it's one and only purpose which is, which is possible for all, St. Simeon taught, not simply a, a, a chosen few, a few great mystics, but given, given for all the possibility of experiencing union with God and the experience of the vision of the uncreated uh, light of God. So this, this particular uh, expression of, of monastic life uh, acquired the name of hesychasm. Hesychasm meaning, meaning quiet or silence, the, the life of contemplation, and it's, of course, going to attract many more great people to it. The, the greatest, uh, we'll speak of him probably a, a few weeks from now, St. Gregory Palamas. 
And also, uh, the life and work of St. Simeon, the new theologian, was seen as a kind of call to renewal for uh, the, the church in, in uh, Constantinople, which had spent so much of its energy in, in doctrinal controversies, as important as they are, defending the icons, all of the, all of the uh, controversies regarding the articulation of the church's faith, regarding the, the nature of Christ. And that combined with the very prescribed form of life that was lived within the circles of the imperial city, St. Simeon is raised up as a call to the most basic renewal of people's souls that the purpose of, of the entire life of the church is not simply to provide an orderly Christian society in this world but is to lead people to the vision of God. Also, another significant development in 10th century Constantinople uh, is a controversy once again concerning marriage. And it's during this time that the church is made more and more responsible by the state for every aspect of marriage and I don't think we have mentioned this much up to this point. In, in the early centuries of the church, up and even uh, later on, up until uh, the, the eighth and ninth century, when people got married within, uh, within the society of, of the Roman Empire, the, the, uh, the empire in, 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 whose capital was in Constantinople, you had to do two things. First of all, you had to go to the imperial office, the registry, as it were, and you had to sign the marriage contract and, and uh, agreement of betrothal, and that was seen to be a, a legal binding contract in the same, the same sort of sense that the Western marriage vow came to have, though, though the East never used the form of the vow in the wedding. R rather, it was the signing of, of the contract. And then, having done that, if you were Christians, uh, uh, Orthodox Christians, and of course, as time went on, more and more people were until eventually it can be said that the entire population of the empire was at least formally uh, members of the church, except for, for maybe a few barbarians and, and heretics. Then you went to church, and you went to the liturgy, uh, wearing crowns, because it was the custom to, to wear the marriage crown as a sign of martyrdom and, and, the, and also the glory of of the, the married life, and received communion together at the liturgy, and then the priest or the bishop would say a special prayer, blessing the marriage. So, so the marriage in the early church was relatively simple. But then, more and more, both the, the betrothal and the crowning are given a more developed liturgical form. And finally, by the 10th century, the uh, emperor decides that the church is required, or, or rather, anybody who is going to be married within the society of the empire has to have their marriage blessed by the church. So the church becomes, the, as it were, the marriage agency, the marriage bureau for all marriages. So that means the church has to deal even with marriages of those who are outside the church, those who's, who are living lives that are irregular in the church. Uh, and this, this pattern of, of uh, requiring the, the, uh, the presence of the church or, or the, the representative of the church, uh, the priest, in all marriages prevailed in, in uh, many, uh, many European countries uh, up, until, up until the 20th century, as a matter of fact. But this is where it comes from. There was uh, a controversy, as I mentioned, and that is the, the emperor, uh, in one of the emperors, I forget who it, who it was offhand, uh, in, in the uh, 10th century wanted to be married not a first, second, third, but a fourth time. And the patriarch Nicholas, Nicholas Mysticos, said that he under no circumstances would perform a fourth marriage for the emperor or for anybody else. And, the, and of course he, was, he was persecuted and, uh, for, for this decision by, 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 the, uh, by the emperor, but uh, would, not, would not compromise. And so 
the canon passed into the body of, of legislation, church le legislation concerning marriage, that under no circumstances could a fourth marriage be entered into by anyone. And that was not to say that, that the second and third marriages were of themselves to be considered positive things. Rather, they were considered also to be contrary uh, to the ideal of Christian marriage, which, by which monogamy means one marriage period, not uh, until death do us part, as came to be articulated in the West, but one marriage that was in this life that existed in a way that could not be defined beyond this life, it was not terminated by physical death. Of course, it did not continue in the same way and, and would, will not continue in the same way in the heavenly kingdom, as the Lord said in the gospel. But second, second or third marriages, even for widows and widowers, uh, was not regarded as the ideal, and of course is not regarded as the ideal by St. Paul. That's why in the practice of the Orthodox Church to this day, and it, and it was finally uh, legislated at this time, that if, if a person is entering into a second marriage, there is a different liturgical service that is done that is penitential in nature, and this service is done no matter what the reason for the, uh, the end of the first marriage was. Either the person was, was widowed or, or there was a divorce for reasons of adultery, unfaithfulness on, on one, uh, on, oh, in, in, where one of the partners is concerned, or a, a cause that would be considered equal to the gravity of adultery. Now, in, there is this expansion of the church, as we uh, spoke last time, into the Slavic regions. The Bulgarians uh, have all become uh, converted to Christianity in its, in its Greek expression. And they set up, they established with the Tsar Boris and his son Simeon a flourishing state that is independent of the empire in Constantinople. Uh, Tsar Boris and his son Simeon are, are kings of, of, within their own right. But, for example, when, when Tsar Boris is, is uh, baptized, the emperor of Constantinople is his godfather. So, so the emperor in, in Constantinople is seen to be the kind of, uh, not, uh, not king of Bulgaria, Bulgaria has its own independent uh, ruler, but still that the kingdom of Bulgaria is seen to, to exist as having loyalty to the, uh, to the um, emperor empire in Constantinople. The 10th century in Constantinople and in the Greek church in general also sees uh, the uh, resurfacing of uh, another heresy, another expression of a heresy that we've heard of before. It's given another name this time. They're called the Paulicians, but they are uh, none other than another, uh, another uh, version of the Gnostic uh, Marcionites that we spoke of before. Those who regarded uh, only the soul, the, the spiritual or immaterial aspect of creation and of the human being as created by the good God. Everything else, uh, everything material was created by, by another God who is evil and therefore uh, matter is opposed to spirit. The, the, these Paulicians were also uh, Marcionites in the sense that, and they're called Paulicians from the name of the Apostle Paul. They uh, accepted the, the writings of the Apostle Paul as being the most important of the New Testament canon, but they, they used them completely out of context. They, they taught that Christ was the adopted son of the Father, that he was not the son of the Father by nature, but he was adopted at the time of his baptism. They completely rejected anything that, that was a material expression of the church's life. Uh, sacraments, hierarchy, uh, veneration of Mother of God and the saints, veneration of relics, use of icons, even use of the cross. In some ways, they sound rather like uh, uh, what, will be, uh, what, what will be called later on the extreme fringe of the Protestant Reformation. And indeed, uh, it can be said that there is a sort of link 
because these Paulicians first uh, surfaced on the eastern, uh, the eastern borders, uh, or, or outside the eastern borders of the empire in Armenia, they were very good soldiers. So they were hired, even though they were heretics, they were hired as mercenaries in the Byzantine army and were brought uh, further, to, uh, were brought west and settled in Bulgaria. And there they uh, got another name. They, will, they be, began to be called the Bogomils and later on spread to Western Europe, to Italy and France, and we'll hear of them uh, later on as the Albigensians and the Cathari that, that created such havoc uh, in, in the medieval Latin church. The final and, and most significant, uh, of course, uh, uh, thing that happened in the 10th century is the conversion of the Russians. Uh, in the year uh, 988, that was the year when Prince Vladimir of Kiev uh, asked the church, asked the emperor uh, to send missionaries to, uh, to his city, to Kiev, to bring the Christian faith to his people. Now, we need to have a little background to, to understand what was going on there. It's not that Christianity didn't exist in that area of the world up until St. Vladimir. First of all, uh, you must realize that when we speak of, of Russia or Rus, as it would be called most properly at this time. You can't imagine the, the uh, map of, of Europe and Asia now and, and Russia, Russia now uh, be, having any kind uh, of existence then. Uh, rather, the Rus were people that had settled ar along the river Dnieper, so in southern Russia, or what would be called now the Ukraine, for example, in, during this time in the 10th century, the city of Moscow didn't even exist yet. So all of these great Russian cities that people think of when they think Russia, forget about it. They weren't there. Uh, Kiev was there uh, in the south. And the, the people who had settled in that area, Slavic tribes, were ruled by Vikings that had come down from the north. Uh, just as the Vikings came, swept uh, through, through northwestern Europe, they also came down uh, toward Constantinople and began to rule these Slavic tribes in, in what is today southern Russia. And the, the Vikings were called, uh, in that part of the world, the Varangians, but they are the same people. And a, a prince named Rurik, a Viking prince, began a state in Kiev, and several generations from Rurik, we have Prince Vladimir. Prince Vladimir's grandmother, Olga, had at, in her time converted to the Christian faith. She was baptized and given the name of Helen. So in the city of Kiev, and there was, uh, there was a, a lot of trade going back and forth between Kiev and Constantinople, there were Christian settlements. There were, there were Christian congregations before St. Vladimir. But it's at the time of St. Vladimir that, that he asks for the missionaries to, to uh, bring his people into the church. And most people that have read something about, about this period are familiar with the famous story that, that St. Vladimir sent uh, emissaries all over the known world then, uh, as, at least as far as he know, knew it, to investigate the various religions. And, and he, people visited the Jews, and people visited the Muslims, and people went to Germany and visited the, the Latin Christians there, and came back with various reports, some negative, some positive. Uh, they, especially, uh, they especially did not like the Muslims because the Muslims would not drink. And when St. Vladimir heard that, he said, for the Russians, this is impossible. <laughs> uh, and and the, the, the emissaries came back from Germany where they had gone to the Latin services. And, and they said that they do many good things, but we found no beauty there, they said. But then the ones that went to Constantinople and attended the liturgy in, in the great church, Hagia Sophia, came back and said, we did not know uh, whether we were in heaven or on earth. We cannot even describe the beauty that we saw there. All that we can say is that God dwells there. 
uh, in, 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 uh, within uh, the worship of, of that great church. And this expression, whether, whether this is an historical description of what went on, it's impossible to tell. But nevertheless, this description is very significant because it expresses something that can be said to be at the, the heart or, or in the soul of uh, particularly the Russian expression of the Orthodox faith. Uh, this sensitivity to beauty. Uh, the, the Russian people were, were converted to Christianity because they were overwhelmed by the experience of divine beauty within the context of Christian worship. So, uh, uh, they're, they're on the other hand, or, or if not on the other hand, in addition to uh, the motives of St. Vladimir, he did want to have an alliance with the Emperor of Constantinople. He wanted to marry the Emperor's daughter, Anna, and of course that would only be possible if he and his people came into the church. So both happen, but the most remarkable thing is that uh, St. Vladimir, and we, we do of course call him St. Vladimir, prior to his baptism, lived in every way uh, the, the bloodthirsty, uh, lustful life of a Viking prince, vengeful toward his enemies, having dozens of concubines, uh, a, a lecherous man given to all sorts of excess and cruelty. And following his conversion, he underwent a total uh, reform of his life in which he became a wise, merciful, just ruler of his people, trying to live the gospel in an as intense manner as he could, even, even to the point where he, he could not be convinced that uh, the use of, of capital punishment was permitted to him anymore after his, after his conversion to Christians. He thought that to, to punish criminals with execution was contrary to the gospel. And even when the Greek bishops tried to assure him, oh no, it wasn't. In fact, that he, should, he was responsible as, as having his authority from God to keeping order in the state and the, punishing of, the punishment of criminals was his responsibility. He, he could not be convinced of it. He, he, took, uh, he took great care of the poor. It, it is also true that uh, the, at least the, the conversion of, of the circle of those who were nearest to him, the, the uh, nobility of, of the, the Kiev society, was pretty much by force, though, though there isn't any record that, that he actually killed people if they refused to uh, be baptized. But they, the, they're, they're, uh, they were uh, marched all down to the river Dnieper, and there, and there they were baptized by uh, the Greek clergy that had gone up there as missionaries, and they brought with them just as in the same style as, as Cyril and Methodius and, and, their, and their disciples, uh, a complete expression of the faith uh, in, in the Slavonic language. So this uh, remarkable uh, first couple generations of, of the Orthodox life in Russia, I want to uh, mention two uh, two expressions of it to show that it was not simply a surface conversion, a nominal conversion, that there was a, a complete turnaround of, of, the, of, of the Kiev society uh, at the time. And after St. Vladimir's death, there was a uh, disagreement among his sons uh, who was going to receive the, uh, the, the throne. Uh, St. Vladimir had three sons, uh, Sviatopolk, Boris, and Gleb, and I uh, want to read a short account of what happened after the death of St. Vladimir. After the death of the first Christian prince in Russia, St. Vladimir of Kiev, the inheritance should, according to the custom of succession at that time and place, have passed to all his sons and been divided among them. But the elder, elder Sviatopolk had other ideas on the subject and determined to remove the two young princes, Boris and Gleb, Vladimir's sons by Anne of Constantinople, daughter of the Emperor Basil II. Boris was on his way back from an expedition against some troublesome nomadic tribes when he learned what was in the wind and his military following prepared to defend him, but he would not allow it. 
It is not right, he said, according to the Chronicle, that I should raise my hand against an elder brother who now stands for me in the place of my father. Like Jesus Christ, I will be an innocent victim rather than spill the blood of my brother in the flesh and in God. It is better for me to die alone than to be the occasion of death to many. So Boris dismissed his followers and sat down to wait with one attendant on the ba bank of the river Alta. See, this is, this is truly remarkable. Remember, this is a Viking prince. This is not the characteristic reaction of a Viking prince to such a plot. During the night, he meditated on those martyrs who had been put to death by near relatives. So already, although it's, you know, he's uh, the, the first generation after the, uh, after the conversion of, of his pagan father, he knows the lives of the saints. On the emptiness of all earthly things, except good deeds and true love and right religion, and he was sad to think that he must leave the marvelous light of day and his good and beautiful body. One of his biographers professes to give the very words of his prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, who came on earth in this bodily form for our salvation and who suffered your passion and let your hands be nailed to the cross for our sins, give me strength to bear my passion. It does not come from enemies but from my own brother, but Lord, do not count it to him for wickedness. So he prays for the forgiveness of his enemy, who is his own, his own blood brother, uh, following in, in a, most, a most intense way the gospel. And the same thing, and he's, he's killed the next day. And then uh, the other brother, Gleb, younger than Boris, met his end soon after. Sviatopolk's shamming friendliness had invited him to come to Kiev. On his way down the Dnieper, near Smolensk, his boat was boarded by strange men armed and threatening. Gleb was terrified and besought them to spare him. With tears streaming down his face, calling on his father and his brother, he threw himself on his knees and promised to be their slave if only they would not kill him. But he would not resist. And when he saw that appeals were useless, he resigned himself quietly to death. I am in your hands and the hands of my brother, your prince. I am being slain, I do not know what for, but you, Lord, know. And I know, my Lord, that you said to your apostles that for your name's sake, hands would be laid on them and they would be betrayed by kinsmen and friends and that brother would bring brother to death. After the death of Saints Boris and Gleb, they are popularly canonized by the Russian people and the uh, Greek bishops, and for, for many centuries, we're, we'll speak of this at a later time, for many centuries, the hierarchy of the church in Russia is a Greek hierarchy. The, the bishops are, are regularly sent uh, from, from uh, Constantinople or, or from other cities or, or places within the empire. And when the Greek bishops are given this request that these, these uh, brothers are to, are to be enrolled in the calendar of the saints, they say, well, we can't do that. There, there isn't any, any category of saints that they fit into. They're, we can't call them martyrs because they did not die, strictly speaking, for the faith. They, they did not die uh, rather than, than reject, uh, reject the gospel at the hands of unbelievers. They were murdered tragically, but that doesn't make them martyrs, and they're not ascetics, and they're not confessors. And they, so they said, we can't do it. And, and the, but by popular demand, the people said, well, we're going to keep their memory anyway. We don't care. So, uh, the Feast of, of Saints Boris and Gleb began to be celebrated on the 24th, and finally the Greek bishops had to accept it, and there, there we go. Uh, so, we have, and, and a new category of saints is made for them. They are called passion bearers, imitators of the passion of Christ who, who did not resist any of, of the uh, attempts uh, against him, uh, of those who sought his life. So, this is, uh, we, we see that at least in, in, uh, for many people, the living the life of the gospel had penetrated very deeply uh, in, in a generation's time. And also we see a, a unique expression of, of Russian orthodoxy, and that is this desire to imitate the passion of Christ. Uh, another example will be found in one of the first great uh, monastic saints of, 
uh, Russia, and that is uh, Saint Theodore, who, who together with, with Anthony, began the great monastery of the Kiev Caves. And anybody who has traveled to Russia, gone to Kiev, uh, of course, uh, would make a pilgrimage to that monastery where, where so many uh, saints have been buried now for, for a thousand years. And it was begun first by, by Anthony, who, who uh, came from Mount Athos and began the monastery there. But, but the memory of, of St. Anthony's successor, St. Theodosius, is kept especially dearly in the Russian church. And I, I'm not going to read much, but just as an expression of, of of uh, the, this uniqueness uh, uh, of uh, Russian Christian life. There came to the caves a certain Theodosius, and it was he rather than the severe and solitude-loving Anthony. Anthony of, of the Kiev caves was, was an Athenite monk, uh, uh, an austere ascetic, who first struck the Russian imagination and gave an impress to indigenous monasticism. He was the son of well-to-do parents, and as a young man had put on the clothes of a serf and joined the laborers in his father's fields. His mother was horrified and said so. My dear mother, listen to me, he replied to her protests. Our Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself and underwent degradation, and we have got to follow his example in this way also. Later, in face of blows and attempts to shut him up, Theodosius apprenticed himself to a baker and learned how to make the bread for the Holy Liturgy. And then about 1032, he joined the monks at the caves at Kiev. And the monastery of the caves followed as their monastic rule, the same rule of the great monastery of the Studios in, in Constantinople. We spoke of St. Theodore the Studite the last couple times. But, Saint Theodore gave, gave it uh, a, his, his own unique mark in that there was this active, active imitation of the humility and poverty of Christ. And this, this expression of, of imitating the passion and the, the emptying out, the, the self-emptying of Christ in, in, in entering this world and, and being obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Of course, it's, it's basic to Christian life. It's not by any means unique to, to Russian orthodoxy. Nevertheless, the Russians made that in many ways, uh, took that to their hearts. And one sees it even in the, the flowering of, of Russian iconography. Of course, the oldest Russian iconography is simply an, an imitation of Greek or, or Byzantine iconography, which by this time, the, the 10th and 11th century, uh, tended to look uh, quite severe. This was the period of the great Pantocrators that, that uh, could make the Lord uh, look like the fierce emperor and judge sometimes. And, after, after a short time, when the Russians began developing their own school of iconography, uh, and you can see this in, in any uh, uh, books that, that, give, uh, th that show the development of iconography in Russia, there is this softening of the features of Christ's face and, and, and those of the saints as well, a tenderness that is perhaps uh, the greatest gift uh, of the Russian style of iconography to the iconographic tradition. So uh, I, give you, I give you these examples of, of on the one hand, uh, Russian society, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it next time, uh, accepting the faith uh, in a package from the Greek missionaries, especially being won to the faith by the beauty of the liturgy, but nevertheless, as time goes on, giving it their own, their own stamp, not changing it, but making it an expression of, of their heart and soul as their heart and soul becomes more and more conformed to the gospel. So those are the, those are the principal uh, happenings of these two centuries in the East, and we're going to spend the rest of the time uh, in, in the West, and then we're going to wind up back in the East with uh, some two uh, very tragic events that bring this period to a close.